Father, what, a, what an amazing thought that we were beneath a debt we could never afford. We didn't have the right currency that you would even accept. And even if we did, we wouldn't have the right precious amount to give to you. And yet, you showed us mercy in your son, Jesus Christ, and his death in our place. We have been all that you have for us because of Christ. And it's in his great name we pray. Amen. Psalm 23 is where we get to be one more time together this morning. I encourage you to take your Bibles and turn there. And while you're turning there, I'm going to let you know that there is in on the book shelves back there out in the entryway, there is a little gem of a book by Philip Keller called A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. What this will do for you urban, suburban dwellers is it will plunge you, it will drag you into the world of sheep um, and give you a sense of what it is like uh, to be a shepherd and a sheep. And it is a, a, a tremendous little help, uh, especially for a, a psalm like this and the motif the metaphor in scripture on shepherding and us being sheep. Um, there might be some places where, in my opinion, he uh, pushes the metaphor a little too far in Psalm 23, but you will benefit tremendously from this little book, and it costs a whole $4. So maybe you can forego your donuts today for equipping hour and use your money to buy that little book. Psalm 23. Uh, he was, without a doubt, the most powerful man in his world at his time. He was the exalted and powerful, God-anointed, God-blessed, influential king of a nation. But not just any nation, but the God-selected nation, the God-formed, God-protected family nation through which God promised to bring blessing to all the people of the earth. He was the God-ordained, exalted, powerful king of that nation, Israel. And so he had a distinction above and beyond all other kings, and of course we're talking about David. Yet when he wrote in Psalm 23 what it was like to be saved by God, what it was like to live under the salvation care of that God, all that this exalted king could do was describe himself in very humble, lowly terms. King David was a sheep. Verses one to four. And King David was a guest in another person's house. And he didn't even directly, he doesn't even directly identify himself as such. You'll find no statement in here where he says, I am a sheep, or he says, I am a guest. Indirectly, we have to conclude this about himself because he is simply not in the foreground. He's not at the focal point of this psalm. His God is the focal point of this psalm. David had in his life once been much more than a sheep. He, he had been a shepherd. But when he employed the shepherd-sheep metaphor to describe his relationship under Yahweh, he humbly knew which one he was and wasn't. Yahweh was the shepherd. And surely David, at the time of writing this, was the richest man as king of Israel, perhaps in the world, and he had the greatest house of all, wood paneled, endless provisions which he could spoil and honor his guests in his house at his table. But when he employed the host guest metaphor to describe his relationship with Yahweh under Yahweh's salvation care, he humbly knew who he was and was not. Yahweh was the great one of the house. So one last time together, let's humble ourselves alongside David and see the exaltedness of our great God from our lowly, humble place in our relationship with him. He saved us. 
He brought us into a relationship with him. He is the great one. We are not. But the care we receive from our great Savior, Jesus Christ, it parallels what David says about Yahweh. Here's Psalm 23, one more time. A Psalm of David. Yahweh is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. We've been examining this psalm through three worshipful declarations that David made. We've covered two of them. David declared, first of all, God's abounding provision as his shepherd in the first three verses. That's based on David's I statement in verse one, I shall not want, or which is better translated as I am lacking nothing. God's shepherd character and care was so abundant that David could not think of something that he lacked under his God. David had no deficit in life. His second worshipful declaration was number two, God's safeguarding presence as his shepherd in verse four, and that is based on the I statement in the middle of verse four, I fear no evil for you are with me. The better translation of the well-known statement, the valley of the shadow of death in verse four is something more general like this. It's the valley of deep darkness or the valley of impenetrable gloom and That means David is referring not only to the approachment of death, but any deep darkness, any deep darkness in a trial or suffering that would come upon the mind or the soul and overwhelm David. And even though evil may come near to him in those trials of deep darkness, David does not fear evil's presence. Why? Well, because there's another presence that is far more impressive to him. His shepherd, for you are with me. So the good shepherd is the one who leads us, verse two, guides us, verse three, and walks with us also through trials and adversity. And one last worshipful declaration from David in Psalm 23, number three today, God's enticing pursuit as his host. That is what David declared. God's pursuit of him as a host was enticing. He wanted more. This worshipful declaration is based on David's I statement in verse six, and I shall dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. We'll explain the details of this better momentarily, but suffice for now that that, the better translation for dwell in is return to. I return to, David is declaring here his desire to come back as often as possible to Yahweh's dwelling place. Now, let's start with verse five. Let's start with the table that David mentions in verse five. You prepare a table. In the ancient Middle East, the table was the place of deepest fellowship that could take place between people. It was the place where a man hosted his friends or strangers, his guests. It was the place where he would pour out for them the very best of what he had to give to them. It was the place for a man as a guest to be honored and to be favored as a guest. Our culture has award shows, has a walk of fame, has peace prizes to hand out. David and his culture had the table. That was the place to have deep fellowship and great honor. And in verse five, David says, you, Yahweh, prepare a table. The idea here in preparing is that it is thoughtful, intentional, making ready of a table, 
a well-set table. Yahweh, David declares, is thoughtfully laying out a banquet, a feast, a buffet. Everything is just in the right place. And notice what David says about this preparation. It is occurring, he says, before me. And I think the sense here is that Yahweh wants David to be able to watch the intentions of the host, the well-ordered placements from the host on the feast table. In other words, the table is not already done. And it's, it's not already completed outside of the sight and the knowledge of David, and then David gets ushered in to see it, the final display. Rather, I, I think the sense here is the host, Yahweh, wants David to see the length of the hospitality, of the preparations that Yahweh is making for David and keeps making for David, how he intends to honor with each step of readying the table that he has David in mind to honor him. And when we host guests, we just don't do it that way. You don't want people in your kitchen three hours before they come watching you do everything that you're doing. We just want them to walk in and see the final display and act like, well, it was really no big deal. <laughs> As your kids stand behind you rolling their eyes like, you should have been here a couple hours ago. <laughs> right? Yahweh's labor of love in the preparation is to be witnessed by David. And I wonder what the effect would have been on him. Who, who's this for? Me? David sees Yahweh spoiling him, we might say. He sees the lengths that Yahweh is going to honor and favor him. And what a great God who is not shy about letting his children see all that he has prepared for them, for us. And perhaps what's even more stunning than that is that there are other witnesses to this preparation as well. At this scene where the most intimate of fellowship will occur, on one side of the table watching is David, the honored guest, the favored guest, and on the other side are David's enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I, I don't know about you, but that is just not what I would have expected. I mean, what comes to my mind is that God would do all of this outside of the sight and presence of David's adversaries, that God would put them on the dark side of the moon, far away from David, and then David could relax in the honor and the presence and the favor being poured out upon him, honoring David seems like it obviously involves the removal of the threats against him in my mind. But that isn't what God is doing, and it's stunning. And this is where we need to ask questions like, what is God like, and what is he doing? Because he is not what we expect, and he does not what we expect him to do. And think about this. David was a warrior. He was, he was with and even above the mighty men that he had. When would that guy feel least like sitting, not, not sitting, but reclining at a very low table? When would he feel least like doing that? Um, how about when he's surrounded by his enemies? How about when he knows his enemies are watching his every move? waiting for a chance to grab him. And if the warrior David ever did have to eat in the presence of or proximity of his enemies, surely he either did it on the run or under the cover of brush. And certainly he would never recline on the picnic blanket and enjoy a feast, but rather he would eat something equivalent to our MREs, our military ready-to-eat meals. That would be on the menu. But God isn't thinking this way, and he's not acting like David would think or act or you or I might. Again, he is not what we expect him to be, God, and he's not doing what we expect him to do. 
David had men in conflict with him constantly, did he not? Just read Psalms, and you'll see that. He had adversaries, he had enemies, he had those who always had an, a hostile intent against him. And Yahweh the host does not intend, in Psalm 23, to remove those enemies, but instead let them stay and come near and watch what Yahweh is doing for David. God wants David, God wants David to see his labor of love that honors David, and Yahweh wants David's enemies to also see his labor of love that honors David. And I wonder what the effect would have been on them. They want to harm David, and they see the extent Yahweh is going to honor David. They would quickly come to the conclusion, would they not, that they are completely at odds with Yahweh concerning David. They would see that they're not merely at odds with David, but they're completely at odds with David's God. Here is Yahweh doing the exact and complete and extreme opposite of what they want. They want to harm David. Yahweh is honoring David, comforting him, favoring him, vindicating him. David's enemies now realize they have a much, 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 much bigger problem than whatever adver adversity they had with David. David's enemies now see they have a bigger enemy in Yahweh. And there they stand, helplessly watching, powerless to turn away, and not see this preparation by Yahweh for David. There they stand humiliated as they see the one they hate being honored. In a sense, Yahweh is saying to them without words, you are viciously against the one I graciously honor. Turn back to Exodus 23 for just a moment. I want you to see this. Again, what David is experiencing individually is what the nation would, of Israel would experience with Yahweh also. Yahweh says, I'm going to send my angel with you. Exodus 23, verse 22. Be on guard before him, verse 21. Obey his voice, this angel. Do not be rebellious toward him. Verse 22, but if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then watch this. I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. That is a good place to be when God is an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. What's the New Testament language on this? Is it not Romans 8? <laughs> Listen to this. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? That doesn't mean that there's nobody against you. It means it doesn't matter who's against you, Christian. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies, who is the one who condemns. Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Listen, the slaughterers, are not removed. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. I feel like in my mind, I'm seeing the table in Psalm 23 as I listen to those words. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what in Psalm 23 is Yahweh doing concerning David? He's vindicating him. 
And again, Yahweh does this not through the complete removal of David's enemies. The vindication comes in the presence of David's enemies who are effectively rendered powerless against David, though they still stand there. And David says in verse 5 of Psalm 23, you have anointed my head with oil. This is not David's anointing by Samuel, making him king worthy contextually at Yahweh's metaphoric table here. This is further expression from Yahweh of honoring David. Uh, Anointing with oil in your Bible, as far as I can tell, is always associated with honoring someone. And that is what David is experiencing at Yahweh's table as Yahweh's guest of honor. He's experiencing blessing and privilege and even celebration while the enemies helplessly watch. And David adds to that, he says, my cup overflows. That is the way of saying that the, the drink Yahweh has for David at this setting of honor is never in danger of running out. This honor that that Yahweh has for David at this table does not have any rations set on it. Bring the best for David. Bring it always. Never stop. In front of his enemies, in front of his enemies, the honor and the love and the favor and the hospitality that Yahweh shows David, it just keeps coming and coming and coming and coming. David is being vindicated by Yahweh. Whatever the beef is that the enemies have against David, David is vindicated in front of his enemies in the most vivid way it could have been shown culturally in their day. And then here's how David describes all of this so far. Look at verse six. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. Well, of course, how else would you describe what David has been experiencing under Yahweh's hospitality? He is receiving levels of goodness from Yahweh unheard of. And he is receiving steadfast love. He's receiving covenant making love, promise keeping love, immovable love from Yahweh. And this is all happening to David, not because David has merited it, but simply because Yahweh has made a covenant with David and he keeps that kind of loving promise. And when David says in verse six of Psalm 23, that goodness and loving kindness follow me, The better translation of that statement is goodness and loving kindness pursue me, pursue me. And it's probably better with a present tense sense to it. David is caught up in the moment by moment care of Yahweh that he is providing for him and David is passive at the table. He's passive at the table. Listen, this is not his table. He is not the one arranging it, and he is not the one doing food prep. He is not the one pouring any drink anywhere. He is not the one guarding the enemies, making sure they can stay over there and not come a step closer. He is not hunting down where goodness and loving kindness are so that he can go find them. Rather, he is just being pursued relentlessly by his God by the active goodness and the active loving kindness being shown him. God pursues his people. He pursues us not just when he saves sinners. We know that and we believe that and that is true and that is glorious. But he keeps on pursuing believers with this kind of goodness and love. That's the kind of God that he is toward you in Jesus Christ. Maybe another way to answer the question that could arise from verse one, why do I lack nothing? Here's another answer. Because his goodness and his loving kindness overtake me on a daily basis. That's why. 
What deficit could I possibly have? That is the way Jesus Christ is toward us. Are you like Saul? Not Old Testament Saul, New Testament Saul, who once was a Jesus-hating, Christian, persecuting person. Listen, Jesus pursued that man and overtook him on the road to Damascus. And Saul was saved and he was transformed by the goodness and the loving kindness of Jesus Christ in the gospel. Are you Peter? Living in the overwhelming guilt of recent denials of Jesus. Listen, don't forget, Jesus pursued Peter on the shores of that lake that morning. And he restored Peter to greater levels of usefulness, John 21. Jesus' goodness toward you is not passive. It's not a treasure hidden someplace that you're supposed to go find You'll find goodness and loving kindness if you look, (laughs) but it's coming for you. It pursues us. His love for you has never been passive. His goodness has never been passive towards you either, believer. Jesus is never triggered to then give that to you. He just relentlessly pursues you. Psalm 23 Verse six, notice on which days of his life David gets pursued by Yahweh's goodness and loving kindness. Surely goodness and loving kindness follow me every second Tuesday and last Sunday of the month. That's when the elders have their elder meetings. So I, it just seemed random, weird. Why would you say that? Makes no sense. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, sometimes Saturday. Well, I'll tell you what it feels like. It feels like his goodness and his loving kindness pursue me every day that I'm in a green pasture and every time I'm on a good path of righteousness for sanctification, being, I'm achieving sanctification, I'm growing in my faith. It feels like goodness and love and kindness follow me on those days. Uh, when I'm by a water, a place of waters, that ha- a place of rest that has waters, it feels like his goodness and loving kindness pursues me on those days. Deep darkness associated with trials, Those days, what does David say? He says, surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days, all the days of my life. The believer, David, who had green pasture living on some days of his life and who enjoyed on other days of his life waters by a resting place, who had smooth paths of righteousness and progressive sanctification on yet other days of his life, who also had days of his life with valleys of deep darkness to go through, who also had too many days of his life with enemies and conflicts that would just not go away, that believer says that Yahweh's goodness and loving kindness pursue him on all those days of his life. In other words, goodness and loving kindness from God were never not pursuing him. Pick the day. It's a day of deep darkness. What what does he say? You are with me. You comfort me. Is an enemy closer than you ever hoped? Conflict that just won't go away? You're you're honoring me, anointing my head with oil and my cup overflows. I want to press into this just a little bit more before we take David's last statement in Psalms 23, verse 6. Notice the wisdom of Yahweh in all of this, that the wisdom that David associates with God's goodness and loving kindness toward him, it's, it's Yahweh's choice in honoring David, um, it did not include completely removing the adversaries or the conflict that he had with others. Yahweh chose to let it, let them remain visible. Metaphorically speaking, Yahweh even chose to let them come near enough to this table to watch everything. In Yahweh's wisdom, David was honored, David was cared for, 
but not through the complete removal of his adversaries. What God did in his wisdom was show himself to be so present, so near, so supportive, so in favor of David, so good, so loving, such that David could recline without concern for the presence of his enemies. I find that so counterintuitive. When I have adversity, when I have opposition, when I have conflict, I don't have an enemy that I know of. If you are one, just take that bottom tear off portion of your bulletin and put your name on it. Let me know because I don't, I don't know it. When I have conflict, when I have an adversity, my primary thought, my first reflexive thought is how can I make all of this just go away? I just want to avoid it. I want to avoid him. I want to avoid them. And I can even start to pray that and lay that expectation on God. And listen, we no doubt are urged to be at peace right with others so far as it depends on us, Romans 12, 18. And we should always labor to that end to see peace actually replace conflict that we do have. But God also does not always remove all adversity or adversaries from his children who love peace and try to make it happen where they can. So maybe there's something important for us to pray for and, and consider when we have adversity or when we have conflict, when we have opposition, and God forbid, if we have enemies. Along with praying about how we should go about trying to bring peace to the conflict the best that we are, uh, are capable of. Maybe we can also pray for Christ to be near in such a way that even if he chooses in his, in his wisdom to not remove our enemies, we might be so very aware of his goodness and love for us that we think on him far more than we think on the conflict. Maybe we can learn to be content that what my conflict needs most is actually Jesus Christ being near Maybe we can ask ourselves a question like this. What do I want more? Do I want the absence of adversaries in conflict? Or do I want Christ's sufficient, all-satisfying, favorable presence, even if the adversity remains? We can learn from David in Psalm 23 that our enemies don't have to be gone for us to be very satisfied under Christ's good and love for us. When he is near in favor for us, when he has his goodness for us, when we are in his loving kindness for us, adversaries just become less concerning to us. Conflict becomes less all-consuming in our minds. Let me remind you, let's go to John 15 for just a moment. I want you to be reminded of this. John 15, I want you to see what Jesus taught his disciples, what he's teaching us. John 15, verse 19. Here's what he taught them on their last night. If you were of the world... John 15, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world, what? Hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And we know why we are hated. Because we're not greater than our master. That's what he taught. How did he pray? Go over to chapter 17, verse 11. 
Here's how he prayed for disciples like that, like us. I am, no, uh, 17 verse 11, I am no longer in the world and yet they themselves are in the world, that place that hates us. And I come to you, Jesus says to his father. Holy Father, keep them in your name. The name which you have given me that they may be one even as we are. While I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have my joy made full in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. That's our Savior, instructing us and praying for us. It will not always be his wisdom to completely separate your enemies from you or you limit all adversity that you will have in this world. The day is coming when he will do that. It's not today. But he does draw near to his disciples with his favor and with his joy and with his love in a world that hated him first and that still brings serious adversity to us, his disciples. And his father is committed to keeping you, his, in this world of adversity. Another thought to consider, go back to John 13. Isn't it interesting, 13 verse one, isn't it interesting that the setting Jesus Christ chose in which to honor his disciples and show favor toward his disciples was also a table. 13 verse one, now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world and to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, to the uttermost. So during supper, dot, 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 verse four, he got up from supper and laid aside his garments and taking a towel, he girded himself. This is a context of loving kindness. It is also a context of great humility for Jesus Christ. God in the flesh humbled himself, girded himself to serve, to serve his disciples, to honor them, to show them favor, to elevate them. How? Verse five, he poured water into the basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. And that was shocking and that was stunning, especially to Peter. Yahweh, with a table of honor in the Old Testament, took on flesh and at a table in the New Testament honored his guests there. He had to humble himself into the role of the lowest house slave that none of them wanted to assume, the role of foot washer. But Jesus, the one who made all of the arrangements for the dinner, humbled himself to that lowly place and he desired to lift up his disciples in honor. He was content to be lowly and them to be honored. And yet we know that this scene doesn't even compare to the scene to come, which is the cross, right? Whatever lowly position Jesus was willing to assume at his table was nothing compared to the lowly position he took at the cross, his cross. And whatever honor his disciples received at his table is nothing compared to the honor that we receive through his humble sacrifice at his cross for us. You can write down Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 7. Listen to this. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, when we were dead in our transgressions, here's the honor, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. 
Here's the honor. And he raised us up with him. And here's more honor. And he seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. What kind of a God of grace is Jesus Christ? That's what he's going to put on display one day in the kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. We are shown such honor in salvation. And it's all by grace. It's all by his mercy. None of it is merited by us. You can write down 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. Listen, you are a chosen people. What? You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. You once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. All of it unmerited. None of it earned. It appears the lower our Savior went, the higher we go. He humbled himself in death, and we are honored with him. His salvation that is full of goodness and loving kindness for us. Our cup overflows with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He received wrath. We receive salvation honor. Listen, what what David expressed, how much more so can we express under Jesus Christ? Back to Psalm 23, verse 6. What did this Old Testament believer in Yahweh declare under his host's excellent care and pursuit of him? Verse six, I will dwell in the house of Yahweh forever. As we've said in the prior sermons, that translation can be improved upon. It's probably better to translate it as I will return or Really, we need to capture the present idea of it. I return, or it's a declaration of what David will do over and over and over again upon being given the chance to. I I return to the house. This is in response to God pursuing David with his goodness and his love. That pursuit of him was enticing to David. He wanted more. He kept coming back for it. He can't stay away from his host. Yahweh's pursuit of David was enticing, and he declares he once more, he'll keep returning to be pursued by Yahweh. Return to where? The house of Yahweh. What did David mean in David's day? What was the house of Yahweh in David's day? Write down 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 20. Or write it in the margin there so that you know what he's talking about. This is after the unfortunate events of David and Bathsheba, and the baby was born, um, and the baby now is dead. And it says in 2 Samuel 12, verse 20, so David arose from the ground, washed, anointed himself, and changed his clothes, and he came into the house of Yahweh and worshiped. He came into the house of Yahweh. Even though there was no temple building yet in David's day, even there was only still the tabernacle or the tent in David's day, that dwelling place of Yahweh's glorious presence was referred to as the house of Yahweh. That's the setting, that's the physical place for David's metaphor of a host and a guest and a table and honor and powerless enemies and goodness and loving kindness. That is the physical place where David enjoyed the presence of Yahweh. And and here's how David thought about the tabernacle, the tent, or the house of Yahweh. Look at Psalm 65, verse 4. I want you to see these so that you understand what David is thinking when he says the house of the Lord. Psalm 65, verse 4. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Psalm 84, verse 1. 
How lovely are your dwelling places, O Yahweh of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of Yahweh. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house and the swallow a nest for herself where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Yahweh of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Look at verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold, just at the entrance of your house, than dwell in the tents of wickedness. And what happened in that house? Well, two things fused together inseparably were there. The glorious, radiant, impressive, weighty presence of Yahweh himself and the shed blood of an innocent substitute. And the believer, the worshiper like David, came to worship that glorious presence of Yahweh in the tent and brought the innocent substitute's blood. And the worshiper's sins were atoned for through that sacrifice. And the glorious Yahweh received the worship that he was worthy of and due. What goodness and loving kindness from Yahweh is there toward the forgiven sinner who trusted Yahweh? And went to that house. And how much more can we who trust Christ identify with that? Jesus made an astounding claim early on in his ministry. In John chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, he said this to his adversaries. He said, destroy this temple. And in three days I will raise it up. And he was speaking of the temple of his what? Body. In the person of Jesus of Nazareth, what was fused together inseparably in the Old Testament was now fused together inseparably in a man, Jesus. He is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, Hebrews 1. And he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John chapter 3. The believer, the worshiper comes to God through Jesus Christ in his innocent shed blood at the cross. David was pursued by the goodness and the loving kindness of Yahweh whose radiant presence dwelt in a tent and who commanded that shed blood of a substitute be there. And we are pursued by the goodness and the loving kindness of Jesus Christ, who is the radiant glory of God, and whose shed blood secures our forgiveness of sin. Listen, we do not come to a structure. We come to a savior. We come to a man. We come to a person, Jesus Christ. David found Yahweh's pursuit of him with that goodness and loving kindness to be enticing. I return again and again and again. Christian, how much more clarity do we have? Do you not find Christ's pursuit of you with his goodness and his love to be enticing? Do you want more? Do you declare that you will be back again and again to him? When was the last time you said that to him? This must be the substance of our prayers. If we don't pray this, but we pray for other things, what are we praying? Pray for the other things. Make sure you pray this first. And maybe in the middle and maybe at the end. And then maybe just one more time because you want to. We want to. I return again and again to Christ. To you, Jesus, in worship of you. And David says in Psalm 23, verse 6, I will return again and again to the house of Yahweh forever. Or better, better translation, for length of days. That that for length of days is actually parallel to the earlier statement in verse six of all the days of my life. It means something very similar. As long as the days of my life stretch out in length, I'll keep returning again and again and again to my glorious host. That's what David 
is saying, I'll come with innocent blood so I can worship his glorious name. Whatever David, the Old Testament believer in Yahweh, worshipfully declared about what it was like to live under Yahweh's salvation care, we who believe in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sin, we can say even more so. We can worshipfully declare those things even more so. If David worshipfully declared God's abounding provision as his shepherd, we who love Christ must also worshipfully declare how abounding the good shepherd's provisions are for us. We have no deficits in him. And if David worshipfully declared God's safeguarding presence as his shepherd, we who cling to Christ must also worshipfully declare how secure we know we are in our good shepherd's salvation grip of us. No one can snatch us out of his hand. And if David worshipfully declared God's enticing pursuit as his host, we who have been and are still being pursued by the goodness and the loving kindness of Christ for us in the gospel, we must also worshipfully declare our desire to keep prayerfully and practically pursuing Jesus Christ as long as the length of our days stretch. Let's pray. Why don't you just take a moment on your own and I'll give you a quiet, the quietness of the moment to pray what you want to pray to Jesus Christ. What do you want to express to him? Heavenly Father, hear the words and the prayers of your people. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. What we know to be true from this psalm is that you are in front of us, leading us, and you are alongside us, walking with us, and you are even behind us, pursuing us with your goodness and your loving kindness. There is no one like you. We love you. Father, open the eyes of any here this morning who have not yet cast themselves on your mercy in Jesus Christ. Let them see that he has paid the price that he is the shepherd of the soul that has been wandering far from you. Draw them to your son, even now, by faith. And it's in his name we pray, amen.